Yes. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Good afternoon, everybody. Nice to see you here. Nice to see a full pack room. Um, I'll tell you something about uh, Elasticsearch, Lostash, and Kibana, or Big Data for DevOps, as it's subtitled. Um, the session is in uh, two parts, plus a third one, obviously, for questions and answers. I'll first start with an introduction of Elasticsearch, Lostash, and Kibana. Um, and then we'll walk through a real-world use case that we've been doing at a major, major Dutch bank. And I'll show you something, what we did there and what we achieved with Elasticsearch, Lostash, and Kibana. But first, let's get started. Uh, the, title, uh, the talk is titled ALK. Uh, this is not about the loss in uh, Croatian, if I pronounce it correctly. Um, this is a male one, by the way. Uh, but it's about Elasticsearch, it's about Lostash, and it's about Kibana. Uh, we'll walk through each of them uh, shortly. Together, they have three separate roles, and Elasticsearch, Lostash, and Kibana provide you a way to monitor your application. How do they do that? Lostash is there to collect your logging information from your application. Elasticsearch is there to combine all the information, to store it, and to analyze it and Kibana is there for visualization purposes. Um, I've been talking about ALK, but in the rest of the talk we'll change the order a bit because logically data flo flows from your application through Lostash to Elasticsearch and finally is queried using Kibana. So we go to Lostash, Elasticsearch, Kibana. What you can do with Kibana is something like this. Um, and this might look pretty impressive. Um, but it all starts with this. <laughs> and there's a few steps in between, and we'll look at them. It starts with Lostash. Lostash is a tool that you can use to um, process your logging information. And this logging information can have various sources. It can come from, for example, log files, which is a pretty obvious pattern. Um, but you can also have a logging from other sources, such as syslog on Unix systems, standard in, you can uh, uh, look at uh, chat runes. You can have log4j write directly to logstash. You can have uh, sockets. Uh, you can query IRC whatsoever. Um, logstash first uh, reads the input, just reads and reads and reads. Then it starts processing, which is mainly filtering. In this step, Logstash can extract semantic from your log file because obviously a line in your logging is just a sequence of characters and it has no semantics, it has no meaning. Using tools like uh, Grok or uh, GAOIP databases, you can add information to your log lines. You can remove information if you want to. Maybe your log file contains sensitive data that you don't want to have in your monitoring system. You can try to uh, match fields to certain patterns, such as sitter ranges for IP addresses, dates. You can try to extract numbers, DNS records, user agents whatsoever. And the last step in a log stash configuration is what to do with the process log files output, so as to say. You can send your output to another system, like Graphite. You can send it to Elasticsearch, what we will be doing. You can have it emailed to your mailbox, not advised for high production loads. You can write to another file. You can, well, you can send Jira tickets. You can create Nagios tickets. Well, whatever you want. Um, or you can send it, for example, to Redis for further processing downstream. Next in, this, in, the, uh, in the picture is Elasticsearch. Now, what is Elasticsearch? Elasticsearch is des best described as a search and analytics engine, which is a pretty vague term, like what does it do? Well, one thing that's very interested, interesting about Elasticsearch is that it's very scalable. You can easily combine multiple instances, they'll form clusters, and these clusters are very, very powerful. What we do in this setup is that we just use Elastic to store collected and interpreted log lines from a lot of applications in a very uniform way. And if these log lines from various applications share common information, such as transaction IDs or whatever, you can even relate those data. 
And you can uh, filter events and query events if you have a suitable client. In fact, everybody has a suitable client because it's just plain HTTP, but the Elastic Search interface isn't very easy to query by hand. So there's tools like Kibana, which provide a very graphical way to do that. Speaking of Kibana, Kibana is actually the main tool that's used as dashboarding for Elastic. It's written in just HTML and JavaScript, so you don't actually need to run, you don't need anything to run it. The only thing that you need uh, when it comes to storage is Elasticsearch, because Kibana stores its configuration in Elasticsearch. In older versions, if you started Elasticsearch, it also automatically served Kibana out. Well, that's gone. Now, right now you have to start two separate pieces of software and tell Kibana where to find Elastic. But, well, that's just a simple bit of reverse proxying and that's, that's solved, obviously. Kibana has two main features. The first one is filtering. Using a filter, you determine what data from Elastic is used to populate your current dashboard. And the second st step in Kibana is querying, where you add labels or tags or categories to each and every document that you have retrieved using the filter. Well, this is just, just a bird's eye overview. It's a bit short to dive into deep details. But let's first look at the real world use case. We've been using Elasticsearch, Lostash, and Kibana at ING. ING is a major Dutch bank. It's said to be the largest bank with an estimated market share of around 40%. And um, if you ask Wikipedia, because Wikipedia knows everything, um, they say that in peak times, uh, ING roughly processes 1 million concurrent customers. Well, that's, that's quite big. Okay, it's not Facebook, but it's quite big. And uh, we'll zoom in into one specific part of the internet banking system. That's where you have created a transaction to transfer money from your account to somebody else's. And uh, obviously the bank wants to make sure that you're authorized to do so. So you need to send a verification code. You, you need to type a verification code that has been sent to you using an SMS message. And we'll look at that system. Now, first off, um, we, we just talked about the, 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 the components, Lostash, Elasticsearch, and Kibana, and you might be tempted to think, well, it's easy to set it up. It's just like this. I have a couple of applications. They have Lostash, and they send data to Elasticsearch, and then you can access Kibana, and that will probably work. However, um, the guys behind Elastic, they advise you to uh, actually have some extra component, Redis. The reason is that um, you, you can do asynchronous processing, so you can very quickly write your data into the Redis queue and be done with it. And then there's this other Lostash process, which is displayed at the bottom, and it does further processing. It can be used to, for example, correct for the fact that some systems run in different time zones. It can do further anonymization of data if that's needed. And it will, in the end, write the data to the Elastic Cluster. An additional advantage of this is that in case your Elastic Cluster goes down or breaks or something, you can actually rebuild it and rebuild the data as well because it's in the Redis Cluster as well. You have kind of a backup. If we take a look at how Lostash is set up, then the application that we had to deal with provides two kinds of log files. There's a technical log file with exceptions, stack traces, well, that's what we all know. Um, and there's a so-called audit log file. And it provides a log entry for every message, for every transaction that has been authorized or created or whatsoever. And this audit log is both very interesting because it contains a lot of detail, but that also makes it dangerous because these details are not always allowed to be displayed in a monitoring system. We'll look at that later. So what we did with Lostash, um, well, we, we let it uh, read both application log files, both the technical logging and the audit logging. 
and we let it add some information like the host name on which the application was running, um, the environment, so whether it's acceptance or production, the actual name of the application, that kind of information. It, uh, we also have it remove information. As I said, the audit log contains very much detailed information. There's customer names, there's bank account numbers, there's transfers, the, the description that you have to supply when you create a transfer, the amount of the transfer. Monitoring systems aren't secured, so anybody can look at them. That's more or less the ID. You can't have the, all the details of a transaction in your monitoring system. That would be a big privacy violation, obviously. So you, ha you have to make sure that that information is removed. And finally, some of the log records, especially the audit logging, is transformed into a form that's better suitable for processing in Elasticsearch. Elasticsearch uses documents with fields and a log line in my log file is just one line and there's no extraction of fields whatsoever and Logstash takes care of all of that. And then finally ships the parsed log event into Redis. We'll not look at how the Redis queue is read and copied into Elasticsearch because that would be a bit out of scope for this talk. Let's take a look instead at how Elastic is set up. <coughs> As recommended by Elastic, the company behind Elasticsearch, um, we've created a cluster with Elastic nodes. We've used six nodes initially, five of them containing data, and just data, and just one node uh, being accessed from outside, like Kibana. That's also recomm a recommendation. Have one node handle the incoming queries and serve back to the client the results and let the others just have data. Combined, these five nodes have around 300 gigabytes of RAM and they process more or less 73 million events each day, which as of a year ago was 3.13 terabyte of data. That's quite a lot. The cluster contains one month of history. That's just for well, economic reasons. You can, you can store all of your history like three or four years ago, but well, you would need an enormous amount of disks and it's just not interesting. Nobody's going to look back further than say one month. After one month, nobody cares anymore, at least not for monitoring purposes. And the Elastic setup, as I told you earlier, earlier also hosts the Kibana files, the HTML, the JavaScript files, and stores the configuration of the dashboards in Elasticsearch. Now let's take a look at Kibana. Well, as I said, Kibana uses filters um, to, de to determine what data is to be displayed in your dashboard. What we did was we created filters, so we could easily create two dashboards with the same configuration, one for production environment and one for acceptance environment. Because for the, for the rest, these dashboards were equal. The only difference is that you have separate hardware servers to uh, monitor. And we added a filter that we only wanted to see the data after the last 24 hours. Usually, if it's more than 24 hours ago, well, you can look it up, but you don't need to know it right now. This is actually an anti-pattern because Logstash uses a specialized type of index in Elasticsearch, it's a time-based index, and these rotate every midnight. And if I say to Kibana, I want all data from last 24 hours, that means I will almost use, I will always use two indices to access my data, which is expensive for Elastic. But the problem is you need to monitor your system and you you want to see trends in your application. You don't want to see the last hour because that's too short. You don't want to see the last two weeks because that's way too much. About 24 hours is a good amount of data. So well, then it's, it's, a, it's a less op optimal query, but you have to deal with that and m maybe add some more hardware. It's just something to keep into consideration when you do these kind of things. Don't, that you might access two indices. We had a production system and an acceptance system, and both were um, split in two cells, as we <coughs> called them. They had also uh, names, orange and green, and it was just easy to talk about. So we added colors to the dashboard for green and orange, which corresponded, obviously, to the 
cells that belong to them. And that's something that you can typically do with queries. Because queries are for tagging, for labeling your data. And then we had Kibana set up to automatically refresh the data. So every five or 10 minutes, all data would be retrieved again and again from Elastic and redisplayed in the Kibana dashboard. And we also added queries for things like this is an error or this is a warning. We even added a few queries for specific error codes we knew that happened in production, but we didn't know how often they happened. And by using a query, we could easily create a graph that just popped a bar any time that specific error occurred. And so we were able to investigate what conditions triggered the actual error. And finally, we used uh, the uh, rows and the panels in Kibana, which is just a way of, well, uh, efficiently allocating your screen real estate. Because if you don't do that, you have everything in one big row and it doesn't fit on your screen, which is pretty unuseful. Let's zoom into Lostash, because that's actually where most of the magic happens. <coughs> in Lostash, we have an input. Now, as you can see, we supply the path to the file, we supply information about how it is to be processed, and we see that there are two types of files. Next, we see the filtering, and this is, um, first we use Grok for pattern matching, so we supply a pattern, and if the pattern is matched, specific parts of the line are extracted to fields, and then we remove the original field. We do the same thing for audit logging, this is an example of an audit log entry. And as you can see, there's things like, hey, an, an, an IBAN, that's a bank account number. We need to remove that for sure. Well, there's a lot of configuration needed to do that. And I'm not going to explain it all because, well, we need another half an hour for that. Um, but you can ask uh, after the, during the break. But basically, we split the file, uh, the, the log entry into parts. We remove all parts that we know are sensitive and then we remove the original line. And in the end, you're left with a document that has a timestamp and some fields that are not considered sensitive. And just in case your pattern matching might fail, you get an extra tag in your log event, and that's called grog parse failure. If it's there, we, we remove everything, just to be sure. We started initially without it, and then grog sometimes failed. And then we still had bank account numbers in a publicly visible system. Oops, not too good. And finally, we shipped the data to Blostash. Uh, I mean to Radish. Okay. Um, as I said, this is, this is what you can end up with. This is a kind of dashboard. And as you can see, there's strands in the uh, upper or in the secondary row with uh, data divided over green and orange cells. There are specific uh, operations being executed specific error types, and just general log lines. Now I have a few questions for you. What do we see here? The picture shows us the load for each server in the production environment. As I said, one green, one orange. What is happening here? Anyone? Excuse me? Switching from one server to the other. To the other. Close. Close. There's one specific reason for that. It's a go live of a new version of the application. So close enough. Um, as you can see, one server is taken down. The other server is taking over all the load. And then after a few minutes, we exchange roles and deploy the other server. Next one. What's this? It's a bit hard because I didn't tell you what the second row is. The second row uh, shows uh, error messages. Um, and as you can easily see, there's a small disruption over there. There's a few errors locked. But you can also see a small disruption in, in the traffic in the upper right corner. Sorry? I don't know anymore what the reason was. It's two years ago, probably. But it was a small disruption in the service. This is uh, my, uh, w one of the nicer ones, I think. Um, a bit of context, because you might not be able to guess it. Um, in the Netherlands, um, all people get their wage almost at the same time, in the last week of the month. And there's one month where almost everybody gets an additional uh, extra 
wage. It's called the vacation bonus. It's about 8%. And what we typically see is that in that last week of May, everybody starts to check their balances. And as soon as the wages are in, including the, the bonus, people transfer it to their savings account. So we see a, this is data for one week, and we see one day when wages were paid. And everybody starts transferring it to the savings account. Yeah, I got my extra money. But actually, this is the nicest one. Any clue what you see here? Night day period? Mm, well, looking at the time range is close. But the most interesting part is actually over there, around 20 p.m. Exactly. This was the FIFA World Cup, uh, June 23, 20, 2014, Netherlands against Chile. Netherlands won 2-0. Um, but as you can see, the match started at around 5 p.m. <laughs> Nobody cared about finance. <laughs> Half time. Oh, wow, yeah. Let's check my bank account. <laughs> oh, match is starting again. Nobody cares again. And then after the match, people started doing their finances again. And traffic went up. We came in the, in the office the next morning. Everybody was happy because we won 2-0. to zero. And we looked at the screen and we saw this. And we, wow, it even happened in production. Oh, that was <laughs> r rather funny. Anyway, uh, we're almost uh, through with time. Are there any questions? How much does this cost for a small Croatian bank? <laughs> well, the, <laughs> the, so, the software itself is it's open source and free, um, so you don't have to pay for that. Um, if you want a, a, a six-node cluster with 300 gigabytes of RAM, you might not get that for free. Even not, not even in Croatia, I'm sorry. Um, it, it really much depends on, on the hardware that you use. Um, as I said, ING is a rather, rather large Dutch bank, and, well, they can afford to just slip in a few servers and allocate it to this. But if you're in a smaller bank, you, know, you might be able to do this with fewer hardware resources. So it, it's actually determined by the hardware cost. Whether I have performance metrics for some hard, sorry? No, um, I don't know exactly what, uh, uh, what the hardware exactly costed and Apart from the 300 gigabytes of combined RAM, I don't know about the CPU or disk specs. So I'm sorry I have to disappoint you in that, but I can't give you uh, those numbers. Um. Uh, how many time did it take you to set up the stack? Well, the good news was, th the question is how much time took it to set it all up. The good news was that Elastic and Redis were already set up for me, so I hadn't to, didn't have to do that. Um, setting up Logstash and thinking about how to, to configure your Kibana dashboard took maybe a week or two or something. Uh, we had some challenges. We, we were running at AEX on that time, um, and uh, Logstash is written in JRuby, and there's no JRuby runtime for AEX 64-bit. Well, I'll, I'll save you the details, but um, if you run on commodity hardware, it shouldn't take too long, actually. And m most time is taken in Logstash configuration and aligning it with your Kibana configuration. Those two have to match to have sensible, sens uh, useful information. <coughs> yes, well this specific system just uh, processed transactions or actually the, um, uh, the approval of transactions. So the only thing that we could see was uh, how many transactions are created, how many transactions are actually approved after receiving the code, and how many are cancelled. Uh, we could see amount of uh, 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 calls coming in, um, so that give you, excuse me, it gives you a rough idea of transactions being processed. But there were other systems that needed to deal with different parts of the internet banking. They also connected to this cluster, but they weren't in our dashboard. Yeah, this was, this was used so that the team, the DevOps team that was, was responsible of keeping the system running, could easily spot when something was going wrong. 
that you don't have to wait for customers to complain, but that you can actually see, hey, there's, uh, remember this picture? Um, hey, there's some errors over there. Maybe we should take a look. Just log into the server, see what is happening. Oh, well, we don't actually need to log in because we can easily uh, narrow down the dashboard to those messages that triggered the red bar. See the content of the error message, as long as it's technical, it's no problem, it's not sensitive or something. See what's going on, oh, maybe it's a hiccup of, of some database, <laughs> maybe it's a hiccup of, of some queue, no problem, or hey, this is maybe getting serious. Uh, and then you can always log into the production server itself and, and, and do further diagnostics. So it's operational monitoring in this case. So Any other questions? I have a rather off-topic question. Oh. You mentioned that on end of May, the Dutch get uh, bonuses and stuff, and they put money on savings. Yes. I wonder if Netherlands have a policy to tax those savings. <laughs> um, <laughs> yes, it's a bit of topic, and yes, there's uh, there's tax policies that say that it's if you have savings, that you need to pay taxes over your savings as well. I'll 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 tell you the details uh, <laughs> afterwards. Any more financial questions? Yeah. <laughs> okay, then, then I think we have a, a coffee break now until, where is it? Uh, ten, ten, ten minutes to five.